On the last Wrestling Bios video, we took a look at Ricky Steamboat's career from 1976 all the way to 1988. When we left off last time, Ricky had just left the WWF and came into the NWA affiliated World Championship Wrestling, pinning NWA Champion Ric Flair in a tag team match. Let's get right back into it as we continue looking at the career of Ricky Steamboat. If you haven't watched part 1 yet, you'll find a link in this video's description. So Ricky was now, once again, back in the NWA and thrown straight into a program with the NWA champion Ric Flair. Remember, Steamboat's status with his previous employer, the World Wrestling Federation, had been severely downgraded after he had asked for and received some time off while he was still the IC champion. You get the instant impression here that others knew Steamboat's worth while the WWF had just wasted an excellent superstar. This isn't the first time or the last time the World Wrestling Federation would do this either, unfortunately. It still happens right up to this very day. Anyway, Flair vs Steamboat became the main feud in World Championship Wrestling, leading to the well-received match trilogy featuring three NWA Heavyweight title matches, pitting the Nature Boy against the Dragon. Throughout history, there have been many great match trilogies that have stood the test of time, from the Randy Savage vs DDP WCW pay-per-view trilogy, Samoa Joe and CM Punk's three outstanding matches in Ring of Honor, Steve Austin vs The Rock at WrestleMania, and Rob Van Dam vs Jerry Lynn in ECW. And I'm not just saying this because this is a Steamboat video, but I personally believe that Ric Flair vs Ricky Steamboat was the greatest trilogy of matches within professional wrestling history. Every showdown felt big, both men didn't let up at all during every passing minute of each match, and watching the matches back today feels just as exciting as it did back then. The first encounter happened at the Chi Town Rumble on February 20th, 1989. This match went around 25 minutes and ended with Ricky Steamboat winning the NWA World Heavyweight Championship. This was vindication for Steamboat. After his last months in the World Wrestling Federation where it seemed his stock had fallen, here he was standing as the new NWA World Champion. The match ended when Flair goes for the figure 4 but gets rolled up by the Dragon, and when the 1-2-3 happens, the audience roars with approval. It's such a great moment not only in WCW history, but the history of pro wrestling as a whole. I felt that no one at the time deserved a world title more than Ricky Steamboat. If you thought the first match was good, wait until you see round 2. Ricky Steamboat and Ric Flair went toe to toe once again on April 2nd, 1989 at Clash of the Champions 6, held in New Orleans, Louisiana. This is a 2 out of 3 falls match that nearly goes an hour, and while I believe you should definitely watch every match of the trilogy, if you only watch one, I'd recommend that it's this 2 out of 3 falls match. It's a wrestling showcase that not only shows that Steamboat was a deserving NWA champion, but it also shows why Ric Flair was so good during this era. The conditioning of both men is absolutely phenomenal, again, they just don't let up during the whole match. With both men scoring a pinfall each, it went down to the wire and the match ending was quite controversial. Flair fell on top of Steamboat while Ricky had a double chicken wing locked in. When both men fell, the ref counted three while Flair's shoulders were on the mat, however Rick also had a foot under the ropes. The referee awarded the match to Ricky Steamboat, but this feud, it seemed, was far from over. After the match, Ricky Steamboat said he must move on from Ric Flair and allow others to get a shot at the title, but once he watched the replay of the last pinfall, he did admit that Flair had a legitimate complaint here regarding the officiating, and so a third and final match was booked for Wrestle War in May. The Wrestle War match is more of a greatest hits Flair vs Steamboat showdown, but by no means does this mean it was all recycled. The 1989 era of the Flair vs Steamboat match had now been perfected at this point, and the two went out there and showcased why they were the best wrestlers of that particular year. Ricky Steamboat dropped the title here to Ric Flair and his NWA title reign was over. But there was such entertainment here throughout each and every match that even if you think Steamboat didn't hold the title for long enough, it can always be said that he had some of the best NWA title matches in the history of the belt. That isn't an exaggeration either. 
Ricky Steamboat brought something new to the title in the same way he brought a new style of athletic wrestling to the World Wrestling Federation two years prior. Jim Cornette said of the Flair vs Steamboat trilogy, Flair and Steamboat did three matches in 1989 that I think were the peak of an entertaining sport versus sports entertainment. There was enough entertainment that the people were on the edge of their seats, but there was enough sport that you could actually believe that they were really wrestling for something they were trying to win. Ricky Steamboat felt annoyed that WCW didn't have a new storyline or angle lined up after he dropped the title to Flair. He did have a few matches with Lex Luger, but Lex was given the upper hand mostly, and to be honest, their match at the Great American Bash in 1989 was quite forgettable. Steamboat had only signed a six month contract, and in the end, he and WCW couldn't come to terms on a new deal. It's a real shame as I do feel the NWA and WCW style of wrestling really helped Ricky stand out but they just couldn't come to terms on a new contract. Ricky left the NWA and debuted in the North Carolina-based North American Wrestling Association in February of 1990. Later in the year, he toured with New Japan Pro Wrestling, getting the opportunity to wrestle the Great Muda and also team up with the likes of Owen Hart and the Pegasus Kid. Ricky Steamboat decided to return to the World Wrestling Federation in 1991. After all that happened during his previous WWF run, you best believe that this would be interesting. Ricky was now billed simply as the Dragon, coming to the ring in this new entrance attire and now literally breathing fire. I must say, the fire breathing visual looked awesome, it really was a nice addition, but Ricky himself wasn't too keen on his new entrance gimmick mainly because of the taste of paraffin or lamp oil that he used here during these entrances. But anyway, Ricky was back in the WWF. Did the World Wrestling Federation learn from their previous mistakes? After all, they let Steamboat go and shortly afterwards, the man was having match of the year showcases with Ric Flair while defending the NWA title. Surely the WWF would push the guy now, right? Well, no, they didn't. Steamboat said that he was sold on the promise of a main event spot opening up for him, but it never came. He had some great matches with Haku, one of which is available in its entirety on the WWE Network from a Madison Square Garden show, and he teamed with Kerry Von Erich and Davy Boy Smith at SummerSlam 1991, getting a pinfall win over Paul Roma during a tag match that also featured the Warlord and Hercules. But this was his only pay-per-view appearance during this return. Steamboat even asked Pat Patterson if he could turn heel during this time, just so he had something new to sink his teeth into, but it was refused. In all fairness, Steamboat was undefeated on television during this entire stint, losing just one house show match to the Skinner, which, as it turns out, would also be his last match of this run. It can't be confirmed whether this is true or not, so do take it with a grain of salt, but it was reported that Steamboat was scheduled to lose to The Undertaker in a quick squash match as Taker was on his path to Hulk Hogan and the WWF Championship. This reportedly didn't sit well with the Dragon and he decided to once again pack his bags and go elsewhere. Ricky was never given any kind of main event run during his 1991 stint in the World Wrestling Federation. No titles, nothing. So Ricky went back to World Championship Wrestling in November of 1991, showing up as Dustin Rhodes' surprise tag partner as he substituted for the injured Barry Windham on his first match back. Steamboat and Rhodes became the new WCW Tag Champions when they defeated Arn Anderson and Larry Zbysko at Clash of the Champions 17, again showing here that while the World Wrestling Federation were hesitant to push Ricky or give him any championships, WCW was always more than willing. I always found his entrance here at Clash of the Champions 17 quite funny. That dragon headgear looked so comical, but still, the crowd popped when they noticed it was Steamboat. After dropping the tag belts, Ricky feuded with the Dangerous Alliance, being part of the great 1992 Wrestle War War Games match as part of Sting's squadron. Ricky would then go on to feud with Rick Rude, having an excellent 30 minute Iron Man match with the Ravishing One at Beach Blast 1992, a match that Ricky won. 
Ricky was able to defeat stunning Steve Austin to pick up the WCW TV title at Clash of the Champions 20, an excellent match here that Steve Austin himself said made him a better performer. This wouldn't be the last Steamboat vs Austin match, but we will get to that in a moment. After dropping the belt just a few short weeks later to Scott Steiner, Steamboat was able to win the WCW and NWA Unified Tag Titles with Shane Douglas at Clash of the Champions 21. Douglas and Steamboat would remain tag champs for around 4 months before dropping the titles to the Hollywood Blondes. At Clash 24, Ricky became a two time WCW television champion after defeating Paul Orndorff. However, he dropped the title to Steve Regal at Fall Brawl 1993. This one is good, really intriguing here to see the styles of both Regal and Steamboat collide in this match. If you want a more obscure Steamboat match, then this is the one. Steamboat and Regal also went to a time limit draw at Starcade 1993. Another good matchup here if you want something a little different. Going into 1994 and Ricky Steamboat had one last dance with the Nature Boy Ric Flair, a final feud for Ricky over the WCW World Championship. They had a match at Spring Stampede that was good but I prefer the New Orleans 2 out of 3 falls match from 91. That being said, it's worth watching as it really is a culmination of their long and storied rivalry. The fans are actually more behind Flair in this showdown whereas previously they were always in support of Steamboat so it's quite a strange dynamic going on here. The ending saw a repeat of the New Orleans final pinfall where Steamboat locked in a double chicken wing but both men fell to the mat. Both men's shoulders were on the mat for the three count and so it was decided that Ric Flair had retained the title. The pair had a few more matches on main event and WCW Saturday night but Steamboat never did defeat Flair for the gold here. So the last big feud of Steamboat's career then would be against the United States Champion, stunning Steve Austin. At Bash at the Beach 1994, Steamboat lost to Steve Austin in another excellent match, a match that helped show the world that Steve Austin could be a big player if given the right opportunities. This one I feel is Steamboat's greatest match from his final in-ring days. The guy could still go as he was coming up to a near 20 year wrestling career. Unfortunately, things took a bad turn at Clash of the Champions 28. Steamboat was booked into a rematch with Austin, a match that Steamboat won and saw him become the United States Champion. However, Ricky took an awkward back bump from the top turnbuckle where he landed in a sitting up position, badly hurting himself here and putting the dragon out of action. Ricky forfeited the belt as he contemplated retirement, saying that he had already had a great career and he didn't want to stay around too long like many other guys seem to do in wrestling. In the end, while Ricky was out injured, Eric Bischoff fired him via FedEx, essentially making the decision for Ricky as he still sat at home with this bad back. Steamboat then found his way to TNA Wrestling where he made appearances as a special referee and later he made appearances for Ring of Honor. In 2004, Steamboat got involved in storylines featuring Mick Foley and even CM Punk, with Punk going on to say that Ricky Steamboat really helped mentor him during these early days of his career. A year later, Steamboat came back to the WWE as a producer, helping the younger talent here with his experience. 2009 saw Ricky get inducted into the WWE Hall of Fame, the WWE now finally giving Ricky the credit that he so well deserved. It's a great induction, it's a special moment for sure, and of course it was the nature boy Ric Flair who inducted the Dragon. The night after his Hall of Fame induction, Ricky Steamboat teamed with Jimmy Snuka and Roddy Piper to face Chris Jericho in a WrestleMania handicap match. Ricky Steamboat, here at WrestleMania 25 and at 56 years old, was excellent in the ring and that again is without exaggeration. Fans were legitimately surprised at how well Steamboat could still wrestle, pulling off high flying moves and gracefully pulling off those trademark arm drags. If it wasn't for the Shawn Michaels vs Undertaker match that evening, I would go as far to say that Ricky Steamboat would have stolen the entire show. So good was Steamboat that he also got booked into a tag match the next night on Raw and at Backlash 2009, Steamboat and Jericho wrestled in a singles match. It was really special for older wrestling fans to see the dragon here once again and the fact that Ricky could still hold his own against someone like Jericho who was arguably in the prime of his career during this time period, it really speaks volumes. 
And that's it for the career of Ricky the Dragon Steamboat. I hope you enjoyed this look at the career of the Dragon, a true legend of wrestling that showed time and time again that it's important to remember your worth, even if people above you do not. His matches were exciting, his character captured the imagination of fans around the world, and his peers always speak very highly of him. As always, hopefully you get inspired after watching this two part series and you seek out some steamboat matches to enjoy. Thanks for watching. We'll